All right, let's finish chapter 13 with the cranial nerves. It kind of goes into a little bit of chapter 14, so let's just do a quick review here. Um, again, new research shows that most individuals have a combination of using their right and left hemisphere. So the fact that your right brain dominant or left brain dominant isn't as clear as it was before, but there are some characteristics that you want probably want to look at so on the left hemisphere you have olfaction verbal memory speech uh, right hand motor control feeling shapes with the right hand hearing vocal sounds rational symbolic superior language comprehension and vision in the right field so that's the left side right hemisphere does olfaction left nasal cavity memory for shapes uh, limited language comprehension left hand motor control feeling shapes with the left hand hearing nonverbal sounds musical ability into a nonverbal thought superior recognition of faces and spatial recognition and visual left field so again people say that hey if i'm right brain dominant then i'm going to have these characteristics if i'm left brain dominant i'm going to have these characteristics What's more important is if there's an injury to one side versus the other. Remember, we learn normal so that we can point out abnormal. So if somebody has a, a stroke to the right hemisphere, then they might have trouble with left-hand motor control. They might have trouble with musical ability, nonverbal sounds, uh, feeling shapes with the left hand, right? So that's what we were more concerned about is if there's an injury to one side versus another, how can the patient present, okay? Um, Again, this is just kind of a, a nice summary of what we uh, talked about before. The thalamus, again, is the sensory processing relay of sensory and other signals relay center. The hypothalamus is more homeostasis, so hormone synthesis, control of pituitary secretion, autonomic responses affecting heart rate, blood pressure, pupillary mm -hmm. diameter, sleep and carcadian rhythms, emotional responses, sexual function, memory, epithalamus, hormone secretion, relay of signals between the midbrain and limbic system. Um, knowing the central lobes, okay, well, the frontal lobe is responsible for smell, motor aspects of speech, voluntary control of skeletal muscles, cognitive functions, abstract thought, judgment, responsibility, ambition, planning, ability to stay focused. So let's say you have a patient that comes in with a stroke or injury to the frontal lobe, right? They got hit with a baseball bat in the front. They fell and they hit the front, uh, right? They got a concussion and they uh, injured their frontal lobe. Well, you can see, well, they, they'll have trouble speaking. They'll have trouble smelling. Um, they won't be able to stay focused on a task. Uh, they'll, their judgment is hindered. Uh, so you can see why we learn normal. So if there's an injury to that area, then we can... Uh, figure out again occipital lobe is vision temporal lobe is hearing and smell the insula is hearing and taste visceral sensation and the parietal no lobe would be some kind of sensory functions taste awareness of body movement and orientation so you would definitely want to know these uh, these are great quiz questions here um, basal nuclei motor control and the limbic system for emotion and gratification and aversion responses all right, let's move on to the spinal cord. Um, now, the spinal cord, it has sensory information, A sends the brain, right? So you have all this information in your body, and we use the spinal cord to send that information to the brain. Then the brain is going to use the spinal cord to send motor commands to the muscles as it descends. So again, sensory, afferent information, A sends to the brain, and then motor efferent uh, information will go to the muscles. Uh, there's no integration processing of information from diverse sources so spinal cord integrates stretch signals full bladder and then the brain decides where and when to urinate right? so locomotion central pattern generators coordinate simple repetitive movements such as walking so that's all spinal cord and then you have those reflexes like the knee jerk response from the spinal cord as well as a protective mechanism that's your gto uh, the spinal cord is 48 centimeters long, stops at L1. Uh, there's eight cervical nerves, 12 thoracic, five lumbar. Remember, there's only seven cervical vertebrae, but there's eight cervical nerves. Enlargement, cervical, lumbar sacral, uh, the cauda equina is 
means a horse's tail and it ends at L1. So the spinal cord ends at L1. Good quiz question. So there's a spinal cord right there. Okay. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar. Now we want to know the difference. Remember that you had three layers in the brain. Well, guess what? You have these three same layers in the spinal cord. So the dural mater is the tough mother, the dural sheet, the tough outer space. That's the epidural space. So if you look right there, okay. Arachnoid mater, that's the middle layer, subarachnoid space with cerebral spinal fluid. All right, and then the pia, which is the soft, delicate inner layer, uh, coccygeal and denticular ligaments right in here. So you see that, okay, so that's the soft matter right here. So you've all heard of epidurals, right? The epidurals. So epidural anesthesia is regional anesthesia that blocks pain in a particular region of the body. The goal of an epidural is to provide analgesia or pain relief rather than anesthesia, which leads to a total lack of feeling. Okay, so there's the difference between analgesia and anesthesia. So anesthesia is something that you would give for surgery. Analgesia is pain relief. So epidurals block the nerve impulses from the lower spinal segments. This results in decreased sensation in the lower half of the body. Epidural medications fall into class of drugs called local anesthetics, such as bubacaine, chloroprocaine, or lidocaine. They're often delivered in combination with opioids or narcotics, such as morphine, fentanyl, sufentanil, in order to decrease the required dose of the local anesthetic. So if you have any kids, you probably had an epidural uh, given before, and you know they childbirth was a lot easier with that epidural. Some like to go the uh, natural route. Uh, good for you. Uh, some people said, hell no. Well, there you go. Okay, so now <clears throat> that's the epidural for pain relief. There's also epidurals that you can give for steroids. So there's epidural steroid injection. They use a corticosteroid plus lidocaine. So they use an anti-inflammatory. So there's a painful nerve root, right? And there's the epidural space, so they'll inject the anti-inflammatory to bring the inflammation down. So it all depends. Basically, it's still given in the epidural space, but it depends on what the uh, purpose is, right? So is it the purpose to bring the inflammation down, or is the purpose to decrease the pain? And so it's all determined by what medication they're going to use. Do they use a corticosteroid, or do they use a local anesthetic. Okay. Here's a cross-sectional of the spinal cord. So again, you have the meninges, you have the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia matter. So those are the three meninges. You have the gray matter, and then you have white matter. Remember, white matter is myelinated. So you're going to have these tracks that go up and down the spinal cord to relay information to the brain and back down. Okay. And the myelinated are obviously going to be faster. So white matter is myelinated, so the information travels faster than the gray matter. Now, you've heard of a dorsal root ganglion. So if you go back here, here's a posterior root or dorsal root ganglion. Okay. The cell bodies of sensory neurons, which are unipellular neurons by shape, are seen in this photo. Also, the fibrous region is composed of the axons of these neurons that are passing through the ganglia to be part of the dorsal root. So th those of you that have had chickenpox before, um, so what happens is the chickenpox virus actually stays dormant once you've had that virus. And if during your childhood uh, um, you, you, you know, pretty much had that or that if you had the vaccine, you're fine. It's going to stay there. But as you turn adult, let's say you have a traumatic event that occurs, such as a, uh, you lose your job, you lose a loved one, that virus, because your immune system can't keep it at bay, can come out to the surface, and then it re represents itself as shingles. So you'll see that, that shingles can come out. So that is basically how shingles work. They are just remnants of your the chickenpox virus, 
And most of the time, our immune system can keep it at bay, but it usually takes some kind of trigger, traumatic trigger, that will bring it to the surface. Okay. So again, gray matter contains little myelin, two posterior sensory horns, two anterior motor horns, two lateral sympathetic horns within thoracic. White matter is myelinated, uh, three pairs of funiculi columns. Some of the neurodegenerative diseases uh, um, that you might have heard of is Alzheimer's, right? Alzheimer's, which is re recent event memory loss, so short-term memory loss. They have a reduced attention span, disorientation. What usually happens in Alzheimer's is atrophy of the gyri of the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus. And you get neurofibular tangles and senile plaques that occur. Uh, Parkinson's disease, also known as paralysis agitans, uh, it's a loss of motor function, tremors, shuffling gait, difficulty with movement sequences. Uh, it's a degeneration of dopamine releasing cells from the substantia nigra. So it's a loss of dopamine. So the treatment is basically giving them levodopa, which will give them their dopamine receptors back. So you're thinking, oh, well, why don't they do recreational drugs? And then that should get their dopamine back. No, no, they have enough issues of tremor, shuffling gait, and difficulty with movement sequences. You can't give them uh, recreational drugs. But they might work on, and they're looking into microdosing and seeing if they uh, can help Parkinson's patients. So you never know. With science, they might start doing microdoses of certain recreational drugs, and they might find that it does help. Uh, for right now, stick to science and stick to pharmaceuticals, and levodopa and carbidopa seem to be uh, the drugs of choice for Parkinson's. So there's Alzheimer's. Look at that. Shrunken gyra, wide sulci. That's what an Alzheimer's brain looks like. Here you get these little neurons with the neurofibular tangles and plaques that occur. All right, so how does uh, alcohol affect the brain? Again, what does alcohol do to your brain? The effects of alcohol on the brain may include headaches, blackouts, delusions, paranoia, forgetfulness, impaired judgment, decline IQ, and or depth. Just a good review of uh, what happens. Uh, the frontal lobe, once it reaches there, alcohol can result in loss of ability to make decisions, loss of coordination, loss of emotional control. So that's about one to two drinks an hour. Then alcohol can uh, go to the parietal lobe, which is slower reaction time. You can start to shake a little bit. Then it can go into the occipital lobe. Uh, alcohol can cause blurred vision, decreased peripheral vision. That's where car accidents can occur. Uh, four to five drinks, um, alcohol can cause slurred speech, impaired hearing. Uh, continue drinking and your coordination balance, this is where you can fall. Uh, and it can go into the insula, which is your consciousness. Usually most people pass out by then, but if they don't, they can overpower it. Well, they can lead to the brainstem and you'll probably die if you reach here. Okay, so be careful when you drink. Uh, again, how alcohol affects your brain, your blood alcohol content really depends on the individual, but you don't want 0 0.08 is the legally intoxicated right here. If you go beyond that, you have coordination and mental judgment issues. You may slur your speech. Consistent stress in your liver can cause fat or scar tissue. 0.2, you'll most likely appear very drunk and lost significant control and mental function. Many people lose the ability to perform sexually, mostly because alcohol disrupts neurotransmitters in the brain, um, you could lose consciousness and your central nervous system becomes depressed. Higher B cell is associated with an increased risk of alcohol poisoning. Here's the blood supply to the brain. It's called the circle of Willis. The blood supply to the brain enters through the internal carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries, eventually giving rise to the circle of Willis. And now strokes, remember stroke is a lack of blood supply to the brain, so a stroke can happen in any of this blood supply. But the difference between a stroke and a heart attack is blood supply to the brain is damaged. That's a CVA, cerebral vascular accident. And blood supply blocked to the heart is a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. Uh, again, the meningeal layer, layers, the layers of the meninges and the longitudinal fissure of the superior sagittal sinuses are shown here. Uh, dura matter, subdura, arachnoid space here. So let's talk about the cranial nerves. Uh, again, cranial nerves are actually not part of the central nervous system. They're part of the peripheral nervous center, but they're found in the brain. 
So you do need to know all 12 of these. Uh, make sure you know all 12 of these. Um, so cranial nerve one is olfactory. Cranial nerve two is optic nerve. Cranial nerve three is ocular motor. Cranial nerve four, four is trochlear. Five is trigeminal. Six is abducens. Seven is facial. Eight is vestibular cochlear. Nine is glossopharyngeal. Uh, uh, 10 is vagus. 11 is hypoglossal and 11 is accessory. So you can remember these. Uh, the mnemonic that I remember is O, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah. Uh, <laughs> or ah, uh, okay. O, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah. Uh. All right. O, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah. Uh. So make sure you know those. There's another representation of it. Um, let's talk about what each individual does. So again, cranial nerve one is the sensory nerve for smell. Cranial nerve two is the sensory nerve for vision, which is the optic nerve. Cranial nerve three is the ocular motor nerve. So it is the motor nerve for eye movement. Cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve. It's the motor nerve for eye movement of the superior oblique muscle. The trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve. That means it does sensation of the face and motor control of chewing movement. So some of these are sensory and motor. So cranial nerve five is a mixed nerve. Cranial nerve six does motor nerve or eye movement, the lateral rectus. The facial nerve, one of the most uh, important cranial nerves, is a mixed nerve. That means it does sensory and motor uh, of taste and control of expressions and facial secretions. The vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight, okay, is sensory nerve for hearing and equilibrium. Cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal nerve is a mixed nerve with diverse sensory and motor functions for the head, neck, and thorax. So make sure you know all these. These are really good quiz questions. Cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve. It's the mixed nerve for taste, GI sensation, and control of various organs. And cranial nerve 11 is the motor nerve for swallowing head, neck, and shoulder movements. And cranial nerve 12 is the motor nerve controlling movements of the tongue. The end.